as you heard, um, this morning we get to finish up this series that we've been in for a while called The Fruit of the Spirit. And one last time, I just want to say, um, he, he'll kill me because I tell you, but we've been watching that video for a while, but thank you a huge amount for Phil. Phil like did all that. He took like a billion pictures and put that together. <laughs> Literally billions of pictures, I think. Anyway, uh, pretty awesome. Um, well, this summer we have been going through this, this series called uh, Fruit of the Spirit, where we've been looking at this list we find in Galatians 5. And, and what we find in Galatians 5 is, is that, well, this guy named Paul, Pastor Paul, he starts to share. He goes, sure, I get it. I know. You struggle. I struggle. We all struggle with our, our sinful self coming up inside of us and, and causing us to follow all these things that, you know, we, we know that they're, they're not right, but they feel good, so we do it. Or, or, or it leads us to these selfish desires that we have. But but you and I, as, as followers of Jesus, we have something that the rest of the world doesn't have. See, we have a faith connection with Jesus Christ, and, and we know him to be our, our savior, which means he, he's died and he, he's forgiven, he's freed us from the guilt of all that junk, of all that toxic fruit that we produce on a daily basis because of our sinful, selfish self. But then he goes on, he goes, but we also have the spirit working in us. And, and that spirit, that spirit causes us, as he says, to walk by the spirit. And then you won't, do, you won't gratify the desires of your flesh. And, and so what he's trying to help us to see is, is that our relationship with Jesus defines us. And, and the spirit that's working in us, all of a sudden, those two things, all of a sudden starts to help us fight against this sinful, selfish flesh inside of us. And, and so the last couple months, we've been looking at how, how you and I, we are a battle zone. So in, in one hand, we have this, this sinful flesh that is, is working on controlling us and leading us down this one whole rabbit hole after another. And on the other hand, we have God's spirit working on us because we are connected to Jesus. We are saved, redeemed, forgiven people. And, and the spirit's working and, and they're fighting to see who can get control. And what happens, as he says in Galatians 5, as we have this relationship with Jesus, as we have the Spirit working on us, we're constantly in this fight until one day, until one day we go to be with him. But in this world, we'll constantly be in this fight, but there's some results. There's some fruit that is going to be happening in people who have a relationship with Jesus, who have the Holy Spirit working in them, and he lists them. Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. Those who belong to Jesus Christ have, have crucified the flesh with its passions and its, and its desires. And so this list, this result, this fruit begin to appear and followers of Jesus. Now, it's important to know, it doesn't start appearing because, you know what, um, we, we got to work really hard to be able to make the grade, you know, and, and be a, a follower of Jesus. No, we, we can't ever do it. it. It's not because, you know, somehow, some way, you're a little bit better than maybe some other people who don't know Jesus, and, you know, you are, are good, and that's why. No, no. The only way we can have these fruit is because we are connected to Jesus. We're, we're rooted in him. We remain. We abide in him. We've talked about that for a while. And because the Holy Spirit is in working inside of us. So this summer, we've walked through each and every one of those fruit except for one. And yet, unlike all the other lists, uh, or a couple of the other lists that we see in God's word, in fact, we read a little bit about it just a little bit ago in Romans, this is different than like the gifts of the Spirit where, you know, you might have one or two and you might have one or two and that's cool kind of thing. No, the fruit of the Spirit are, are a list of fruit results that, you know, you may struggle with one a little bit more than another, but you're not immune to it. 
No, these are the things that should be coming up and growing and manifesting in our lives to some degree because of our relationship with Jesus and the Spirit working in us. And so today we end with a very fitting one, <laughs> one that probably has come up this summer from time to time. I shared a couple weeks ago that we got back from our vacation, and uh, this year our family vacation was 3,197 miles. Nobody was counting, let me tell you. Um, and, and we were pulling a trailer, and, and I remember our trip home, we were 800 miles from the last stop and 100 miles to go. Now we were out east, you can do the calculation, 100 miles from here is just this side of Memphis on I-40, yeah. All of a sudden, we hit traffic, construction traffic, where we just about lost this gift we're going to talk about today, this fruit. It's the end of summer, and I have talked to plenty of parents, and I know that those parents, and they are running low on the fruit that we're talking about right now. We just prayed over the teachers, and, and I talked to them before, and they said, yes, please pray over us. We need an extra dose of this fruit because, you know, those kids that are going stir crazy in our homes are going to be going into their classrooms for the next nine months. And yet, I was married to a teacher. Oh, I'm still married to her, but she was a teacher for 10 years. And she tells me the story. They need this fruit probably more for the parents, us, than for the kids. You know what I mean? And the fruit that we're talking about is, well, and named it as forbearance here. But it's patience. Yeah. So let's dig in. If you got a Bible, pull it out. Turn with me to, uh, to Proverbs 19 is where we're going to start. We're going to be jumping around quite a bit. And, and so if today you have a, a, a smartphone or a tablet or something, it's a great week to pull that out. You can even check in at Facebook and invite somebody to come to church. But then go to this website on the screen where you can go from verse to verse as we kind of jump around a little bit this morning and take notes. Now... <laughs> Patience is not something that's very trendy in our society today. I mean, you, you don't see a lot of it. Like, for instance, this summer I went to the store and I, I, I bought a whole bunch of stuff. And one of those things that I bought <clears throat> didn't have one of those stickers on it, you know, that you can just go off and they, they know the price. And you know what happens when you don't have something that has a sticker? Uh, price check. My number five, five, I need a price check. And, and it's like, <laughs> in unison, you can, you can feel it behind you. That whole line behind you, all of a sudden everybody turns and they're like, are you kidding me? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so, so some guy, some young kid comes out, you know, and he goes, oh, this is what you're going to get. And he shows everybody, this is what they bought, you know. Hey. Doesn't have a sticker on it. Can you believe it? You're going to wait forever because you bought this. Yeah. And, and then he goes, he leaves it there. He goes back to go find another one to, to pick it up and bring it in front. And, and he comes back empty handed because he forgets exactly which one it is. You know, so this time he takes it and he goes. And, and the whole time I'm like freaking out. I'm kind of anxious about it. I want to get going. I'm frustrated. I feel like I feel the heat from this aggravated growing line behind me. Yeah. We don't have a lot of patience, do we? We struggle with this thing called patience. But what really is this fruit called patience? Well, I think there's a few ways we can define it. I think you can define patience as a self, um, self-restraint from retaliating against a wrong. So think about it. What, what comes naturally? Not that you do it, because we're in church here. We don't ever do it. But what comes naturally when somebody cuts you off on the highway? What comes naturally when a sales associate of some sort or salesperson, they get rude with you? Can you believe that? What comes naturally when, um, <laughs> if you have kids, they talk back to you? What comes naturally when a friend says or does something that hurts you? I'll tell you what comes naturally is you want to get even, right? But now look at Proverbs 19. Proverbs 19, verse 11. A person's wisdom yields patience. It is one to one's glory to overlook an offense. 
If you turn the page, you go back to Proverbs 15, verse 18. It says, a hot-tempered person stirs up conflict, but the one who is patient calms a quarrel. And so what comes naturally is we get, have this hot, quick, tempered reaction, right? But what God's word says, and, and I could keep going, all right? Proverbs is good at this. They hit over and over. They got great one-liners about it. And what, what I could say is, is that God's word says that if we lack patience, you know what we result in? Carnage. We result in hurt. But what if, what if somehow, some way, we were able to not do the first thing that comes to mind and react? Another definition is patience is waiting calmly and graciously when you, are, you face a delay or a disappointment. Um, as I said before, we, our, our family vacation was out east, and, and um, we, we try to be smart in our, our travel plans including, so one day we go, okay, we're going to go to the beach. We're finally going to make it to the beach. And so we got to make sure this is a short travel day so we can get to the beach, right? We want to get out there. They, the kids want to get into the water and everything. So 150 miles, 150 miles, that's good. You know, Williamsburg, Virginia to the Outer Banks in North Carolina, that, that's cool. 150 miles, GPS says two and a half hours. We forgot to factor in that it was going to be Saturday, which Saturday sounds like a good day, right? No rush hour traffic or anything. But, but do you know on the East Coast, I, I'm convinced three-fourths of the East Coast say on Friday, tomorrow we're going to go to the Outer Banks in North Carolina. Seriously. Because, and I'm not exaggerating. You can ask my kids. You can ask my wife. 150 miles over six hours. Yeah. We made great timing. <laughs> six hours of frustration. Six hours of pulling our hair out. Six hours of, hey, the beach time's kind of fading. Six hours of, what did my kids say? Thank you. Six hours of, are we there yet, right? And I said, yes, we are. We're in the middle of a sea of traffic. <laughs> Proverbs 14 is what it says. Verses 29, whoever is patient has great understanding, but one who is quick-tempered displays folly. Honestly, my kids were great on that trip. I, I, I'm, I'm amazed. They were way better than me. But a bit more patience would have made a bit more of an easy drive. Think about it in your own life. I mean, how many days have we wasted because because we were on the ride and we wanted to get to the destination? How many relationships have we wasted or haven't seen the full effect because in, in the midst of life, we're so focused on getting to something or accomplishing something that's out in front of us. How many times have the journey or even the journey of life get ruined because we wanna to get to that destination? You can define patience as re remaining steadfast under strain. When I think of that, I think of my, my mom at Christmas time. Some of you know she, she slipped, she fell, she broke her ankle, had surgery, and it was a long process. It was like three months before she could even put any weight on it. Or I think of um, this past week I visited with Dennis. Some of you guys know Dennis, and he, is, he, he broke his hip, and he's in the middle of rehab as he had a hip replacement. Or I think of Megan, uh, Logan and I, we went to, to go visit Megan. She's a 15-year-old in Arkansas. Children's Hospital, we met with her, his, her mom, as she is in the fight of her life, as she's uh, battling this illness and having chemotherapy, and talk about patience. Not like sit back, idle patience, but like, okay, God, it's just going to come. I got to keep fighting. Well, lastly, there's, there's a definition that trumps it all, a definition that allows us to have that self-restraint or to wait calmly or to remain steadfast, and that's seeing it as trust in God's timing and God's control. 
Turn with me to James chapter 5. In James uh, chapter 5, the writer here, he, he shares with us this illustration of, of, of patience. And he uses a farmer with his crops. We'll pick it up at verse 7. It says, be patient then, brothers and sisters, until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its value, valuable crop, patiently waiting for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. Now, I understand, and we'll talk about this a little bit in the end, but I understand this is talking about the return of, of Jesus Christ. And yet, we can apply this in, in many times. So whether you're, you're talking about healing up from an injury that's physical or, or a mental injury or a spiritual in, injury, or whether you're, you're a parent and you're, you're, you're trying to find out, you know, what do I do as I'm supposed to raise these kids? Or, or you are somebody who's going through life going, okay, what is the meaning of life? What am I supposed to do with my life? Or you're looking for that, that, that significant other out there, or, or you're looking for just a friend or whatever it is you're, str you're struggling with. When we know, when we trust, when we're confident that God's in control and that, that he has this and he will provide in his timing and in his way, that's, that's this fruit of patience that is growing and manifesting in our lives. You know, I think for me to stand up here, I gotta, I, I gotta be honest. I mean, this is one of those fruit that I struggle with because I'm not that patient of a guy. I, I like to be in control. I like to have a, a plan. I, I remember telling my mom when I was a little bit younger, saying, hey, mom, I, I really need you to pray for, for me to have patience. And she said, you sure? Because oftentimes when you pray for patience, God gives you an opportunity to really have patience where you have to really rely on his timing and his control. And I said, well, let me think about it. <laughs> and yet... You're probably like me. You can think back to a time, a time where you're faced with a disappointment or a challenge or a situation that was out of your control. And not always. I mean, God doesn't always work this way. I wish he did. But oftentimes we can look at that and we can, we can see how he worked through that. We can see in hindsight his, his timing or his control or, or how he showed that he is in control or that he is good. Now, I was thinking even, even as our, our congregation, we can look back to the whole youth minister search. I mean, some of you guys were on that team, and, and, and there were some, there's some disappointing times along that way. And yet, I know Logan's here, so he can plug his ears, but, but you know, a year ago, six months ago, three months before, he would not have been ready to seek if God was calling him to be here. We can see God's work. I think of couples and, and families that I, I've, I've spent time with or gone through struggles with. I know there's people in here that, that are going through struggles of a loss of a loved one and so on and so forth. And yet, e even through that, you can see oftentimes on the other end where how, how God uses even that time of challenge or that time of struggle or that time where they feel like things are out of control, where they have to really depend on him to bring them to be even closer to him and closer to one another. Huh. But why? Why do we struggle with patience so much? Uh, first off, I, I think it's just kind of how we are wired. You know, we talked about how Phil and Tabitha, they just had their baby. Um, I know he's here, but just in case you don't get to see him. <laughs> Thomas Isaiah. He's a cutie. I also hear he's a really good baby, if there's such a thing, right? Because he's still a baby. A am I not right when Thomas still gets hungry? And when Thomas wants to gets hungry, he wants food now, not like in a little bit or, you know, when it's convenient or after you get a nap or, or you know, Tabitha gets a nap or something like that, right? He wants it now. <laughs> That's how he's wired. Or I think about my kids. September's a, a birthday month in a Hauser household. All three have birthdays in September, and they're so excited. 
really they're excited for the gifts, right? And, and we have family that, that are far away, and so they mail the gifts. And when the mail, they get them in the mail, guess what they want to do? They want to open those gifts. Or if you ever had kids or grandkids and you put Christmas presents underneath the tree, what do they want to do? Come on, just one, please. Come on. It's like Advent number three or something, you know, or the, it's only a couple days. They, they, they can't wait. We're just wired that way. Culture's wired that way. If you think of our culture, it, impatience is a virtue, not patience. It, it's in to be impatient. I, I think of the whole phone thing, right? Hey, if you think about how phones used to be, they used to have cords and wires and stuff. And, and you know, sure, there was that long one that got tangled everywhere, but pretty much you just had to sit there and talk. You know, you, you, it used sparks and stuff when they did this whole thing, and you hated it when there was a zero because it was so long and stuff. Now, today, we take our cell phone out, we hit the button, and if some reason or another is not going, we get frustrated. Or if you do that and it takes a couple seconds for it to connect, you're like, what's wrong with my phone? While you're walking around doing everything else. Or, or, or think about how our society is so instant gratification. We're, we love to microwave things, don't we? We want to microwave anything because it'll save us some time, even if it doesn't taste as well, or you're worried if maybe the nutrients are, are, are going away, or if it gets tough, or, or whatever. It's okay. We save time. We're fast food. So we will trade good barbecue for a McRib. <laughs> Not me, but somebody out there does. It's crazy. We even value one another on how busy you are. So, so the more I ask you, you know, how's life, and you tell me and complain how horrible and busy it is, I'm like, good. It's crazy. But you know all that leads to really the underlining issue. Why we really stink with patience. We stink with patience because our sinful na na nature our, is so impatiently obsessed with our own pride, our own selfishness, our own desires. It's all wrapped up. One day I will regret this, and please don't, I, I really struggle with sharing this illustration because my, I love my boy. He's a good boy. So if you have him, Ashley, I know you have him, you know, Mrs. Brown. He's not a bad boy, but here's something he really struggles with right now, and we're really working on. He is a boy that is capsulated with his world and what he wants. And so it doesn't matter if I'm late for a meeting, it doesn't matter if his sisters are late for practice or late for a birthday party, it doesn't matter if we've asked him six times or more to get his shoes on, there are times still that the whole family's outside or a whole family's in the car, the car's even started, and Nate's not there, and we'll go back in and we'll check on him, and guess what? He hasn't even started looking for his shoes. Ah. And then we finally get him into the car, you know, and we have the whole conversation. The housers can't be late again, all right? Come on. We're all going to get out in a, a rush, okay? We're going to make it in right away and everything. And, and so we park the car, the van. Uh, everybody gets out and goes in, and we close the doors because there are remote kind of doors on our van kind of thing. And, and where's Nate? Oh, he's still in the back of the van. <sighs> and yet, whether it's... Well, there's the kids that are so wrapped up in whatever they are obsessed with. Whether it's we as parents that are so impatient about the fact that they don't listen. Whether it's you getting upset because somebody's messed with your status quo or me getting upset because I hit every single red light on the way because I'm late. <laughs> or there's some silly guy up there who has to get a price check and you're waiting in line. That's our sinful, selfish self that flares up. And Galatians defines that as our flesh. And my flesh, unchecked, cares only about one thing. It's me. 
Have you ever met somebody who was really consumed with themselves, you know, their wants, their desires, their time, their everything? Have you ever met that? Yeah, what you find is that when you meet somebody like that, you find someone who is filled with frustration because um, they're really ticked off when somebody messes with it. What you find is, is somebody who is filled with anxiety because not everything goes according to plan and according to how they want it to go. What, what you find in somebody like that is somebody who's fear, filled with fear because then they're like, okay, now what am I going to do? Have you ever found somebody with frustration, anxiety, and fear? I have. And yet what's so convicting is even though it's a lot easier to go look at somebody else, I don't have to go very far to find that. I see that in me, myself. And I'm convinced you would see that in you, in yourself. And you know why? It's because we're filled with this thing called sin. Because your flesh, left to its own, it's just bad. It's just evil. It's just full of sin. And yet the good news is that Jesus didn't want us to live in frustration, anxiety, and fear. He didn't want to leave us there. He didn't want us to be dictated by our sin. He wanted more for us. He wanted freedom for us. And that's precisely what he won for us upon the cross. Turn one more place with me. 2 Peter chapter 3. This passage here highlights again this, this definition, the ultimate definition we said for, for, for what patience is, which is trusting in God's timing and his control. We start in verse 8. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promises, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. You know, what we see throughout Scripture is, is a God that's patient, a God that didn't give up on the crown of his creation, which is you and I, humankind, even when we, we run rampant and rebelled from him, even when sin just infected it all. But instead, he started a plan to save it. A plan that was very patient. In fact, we can get into a whole other discussion about that, but I think it's awesome when you start to look at Scripture, when you start to look at history and how God patiently waited for just the right time to send his son Jesus. He waited at just the right time where then that good news of Jesus could spread, could spread like wildfire. I mean, we, we talk about how, you know, he waited until there was like this universal language that, that spread across. We could talk about how, you know, he waited till there was uh, the infrastructure through the Roman Empire to be able to spread throughout all all the civilized world. It's so cool to see that. Guess what? God knew what he was doing. But more than that, is that God didn't just come and conquer this, this sin thing and take care of the sin thing, but he was still patient. He patiently waited for, for you, for me, for the people we rub shoulders with on a daily basis so that they might be saved. Wow. I know this sounds kind of weird, but in a group like this, I'm confident. There are people in this room who don't know Jesus. I don't know why you came this morning. That's cool. I'm glad you're here, but... There are people in here that don't know Jesus, who don't have a trusting relationship with Jesus. I want you to know you have a patient God who continues to pursue after you. 
He doesn't care about all the junk and all the horrible things you've done in the past. He doesn't care about the things that are in your life right now. He just wants to offer you forgiveness and freedom. And he will pursue you and he will wait as long as it takes until he comes back, which we don't know when that's going to be, or until your final breath. My prayer is that you would understand that patient God and the love he gives. For those of us who do know him, who have, have a, a trusting, saving relationship with him, we, we've experienced his grace. What we experience every single day is just how patient he is. Because I, as a redeemed, forgiven follower of Jesus, guess what? I still got this sim sinful flesh that's over here that keeps flaring up. I mess up all the time, and you do too. But we have a God who patiently loves us, even as we rebel in his face. Oh, but he loves us, and he forgives us, and he keeps welcoming us back. You know, with a God like that, with a God that is that patient, that loving, that strong, as I realize that I'm defined not by myself or what I do, but I'm defined by my relationship with Jesus, as I realize that the Holy Spirit is, is my strength, all of a sudden I start to see these results, these fruit in my life. I, man, we still struggle with it, don't we? But we start to see these fruits, these results coming out, including this thing called patience. My prayer for you is that if you, you struggle with patience, or should I say, when you struggle with patience, <laughs> that you would turn back to Jesus and you would know that it's through him you're re redeemed and redefined and that you would seek the Spirit to give you that self-restraint to give you that steadfastness, to give you that trust, to give you that patience that only comes from him. Let's pray. Dear Jesus, first off, we just admit, we are messed up people that even though you have given us your spirit, even though you have worked these, these fruits, all these different things into our life, we still flee and run from them as we are still filled with sin. So first off, Lord, we just ask that forgiveness that you have given to us, that you would refresh us and redeem us and redefine us as your, as your child. Lord, we pray that, that your spirit would continue to work in us, to transform us, to shape, to mold us as your child that we would see this fruit of patience come forth in our lives. And Lord, in that process, Lord, we pray that, that even as we show that fruit because of your spirit, that people would see a bit of you and they would know the hope that we have that comes only from you. In Jesus we pray, amen.